Well, hello again. It's, uh, yes, it's been a very long time. I am sorry. <clears throat> There's been some things going on around here. Um, yeah, it's been a little bit difficult for me to, to, to make, make any more uh, recordings for a while. But in any case, the last time we did this, I gave you one and only one of the last part of the Academy, which is the uh, annotated games. And that was with uh, White, Waitskin versus Luna uh, called More Pins. So uh, I'm going to try and start doing more. Uh, and not just this Chess Master Academy. Um, I have just recently changed the way this works. Um, I now am able to record the the sounds of the chess program directly out of the computer instead of miking the speaker. So I hope you appreciate that. It should sound a little bit better. It should sound the way it sounds to me when I watch or, or, or you know do this myself. So um, the only the only thing is is that if I uh, turn the sound up so I can hear what's going on too loud and I keep the microphone on, I get feedback. So. There's a little bit of a difference here. I could uh, actually demonstrate that to you if I turn these other speakers on. And here we go. One, two. One, two. And uh, this is going to start. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so we're going to turn those back off again. Just to, But in any case, um, without too much further, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the mic off uh, when I start this recording of the next game. And as always... Watch this in HD, so you can see the, the let me point my uh, mouse arrow to it, so you can see the fine print here. It's not going to look quite as good as it does uh, live, but uh, you can, if you put it in HD, you can see that it says Waitskin versus Peter, whoever that is, I don't know. Um, and we're going to, he's going to talk about kingside weakness. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and double click this, and then I'm going to turn off this microphone. So you'll hear a couple of clips. Actually, I think I'll turn it off now. And here we go. In this game, I played against a German club player named Peter. Last name was Peter. In Bad Weissie, this is the third round. I played E4. He played C6, the Karl Kahn defense. The basic idea of which is to prepare the central thrust D5. So he wants to immediately take control of the center, and he's just getting ready to do it. I played D4, and he played D5 taking his part of the center, because we know the center is the most important part of the game. So now I have two pawns solidly in the center. He has one pawn, but my e4 point is challenged. There are three basic ways in which white handles the situation. One is to defend the pawn, either with knight c3 or knight d2. One is to play the move e5. One is to play pawn takes pawn. Pawn takes pawn has the disadvantage of after black responds with c takes d5, now both sides have equal central control. E5 has a disadvantage of instead of having a dynamic center, white has a rather static one in which it's hard for me to generate play in the center, and black will tend to put a bishop on F5 and then close it in with E6. Notice it's much better to have a bishop outside of this closed structure than inside, and then he'll develop play along these lines. I played the third option, the main line, knight C3. He played D takes E4, and I played knight takes E4. So now black has a very solid structure but white has a little more central control. My opponent played knight f6. I played knight takes f6, and he played g takes f6. So now we see that at this point, black's pawn structure is a little bit weakened. He has these doubled pawns. If he goes kingside, his king will be a little weak, which means that his king pretty much will stay in the center or go queenside, which is really good for me to know. I began with c3. Now the reason that I played this move is because, actually, in a strange way, because of his bishop on c8. The point is that black has to develop that bishop quickly, because at one point he ha he's going to need to play the move e6 to be able to bring out the other bishop. So he has to put the bishop out to either the f5 or g4 square. The most natural move for white here is to play knight f3, developing my knight towards the center. But now I would allow black uh, a good developing move, bishop to g4. Now the bishop pins my knight, and then he'll go on with his business. By playing c3 first, what I do is I make his bishop move out because he needs to move the bishop out to the second best square. He plays bishop f5. 
And now I play knight f3. So we see that by playing a different, slightly different order of moves, I forced his bishop to go to the second best square as opposed to the best square. After knight f3, he played e6, and I played the move g3. So now my plan is to develop my bishop on g2 to fianchetto the bishop. What that means is to put my bishop on g2 on the diagonal. My pawns are on h2, g3, and f2. My bishop is on g2 so that I sort of seem to have light squared weaknesses, but my bishop fills up those holes very quickly. And it's a very solid, good way of developing a piece, especially when, since I know he's going to probably castle queenside later on, my bishop will be good on that diagonal. Also, the g file is open, which means sooner or later, black will probably play rook to g8, which would attack my g2 pawn if I develop my bishop, say, on the e2 square. After g3, that rook wouldn't do anything. So it's a good way to develop my pieces. Here my opponent played the move queen to b6. Now after playing a move like g3, the most natural thing to do is to consistently develop our pieces, bishop g2. That's obviously what we intended with g3. But my opponent's last move sort of stopped that. Because if I play bishop g2 now, his response will be to play queen a6. A strange looking move, which actually makes my game very difficult. The first point of it is it simply stops me from castling. My next move wants to be castled, but we know the rule. We cannot castle through check. His queen controls the f1 square, so it's illegal for me to castle. I can't do it. And the incredible thing is it's very hard for me to actually figure out how to castle. For instance, if I try to block the diagonal with queen e2, he can play bishop d3, attacking my queen and maintaining the control of the diagonal. I have to move my queen, then he can continue developing. If I allow this move queen a6, it's very tricky for me to finish up my development, and my king is going to be stuck in the center. And if my king is stuck in the center, and he develops, and he can bust open the center to try to attack him, a very important way to attack in chess is to keep your opponent's king in the middle of the board. So if I play bishop g2, I could allow my opponent a pretty dangerous idea. But I stopped it. I played the move queen e2 first. Now this move has more than one purpose. For one thing, I'm simply not allowing my opponent to play queen a6 because I control that square more than once. If he plays queen a6 now, I can either move my queen or trade on a6. And after you look at the variation, for instance, queen takes queen, knight takes queen on a6, bishop takes knight on a6, black plays b7 takes a6. Black has a very bad pawn structure, and the doubled pawns on the a-file will give him big problems. So, he can't do that. And the other point is that I'm defending my b2 pawn. See, my opponent was sort of, by playing queen b6, he stopped both of my bishops from developing. My bishop f1 can't, I can't develop too well because of queen a6. My bishop on c1 can't develop because my b2 pawn is hanging. By playing queen e2, I freed up my G f1 bishop to come to g2 because I control the diagonal. And now my bishop on c1 can move because the b2 pawn is defended. And here my opponent played a slightly wrong move. He played knight d7, which completely allows me to develop my pieces. Slightly better, I think, would have been bishop to e7, because now if I play bishop to g2, he still has the option of playing queen a6, offering a trade of queens. Because if I castle, he can take my queen. And if I move my queen, he controls that diagonal. I can't castle kingside. And after queen takes queen, knight takes queen, it's good for black to trade the queens because there's sort of a rule in chess. If you're better in material, you want to trade down pieces. You can think of that in that if you have three pawns and your opponent has two pawns, the advantage of three to two is smaller than if you, if you have two pawns and your opponent has one pawn. In mathematical terms, the ratio of three to two is smaller than the ratio of two to one. If white has a better game positionally, if white has more space, for instance, it's good to trade down. So black, because he's, he's, he's in a slightly worse position in space, should trade down because that gives him less, he has less pieces to maneuver within the less space. So queen a6 would be a good trade for him. So I simply wouldn't play bishop g2 immediately. My opponent playing knight d7, though, I said no problem, I can play bishop g2 because now if he plays his move queen a6, I simply take it. And after b takes a6, his pawn structure is just terrible. So we see that by slightly changing the, mo the order of my moves, I made black's position a little more difficult. So I slightly improved my position first by playing knight h4, attacking his bishop on f5. His bishop came back to g6 because, notice, if I took on f5, he can't take back because his e-pawn is pinned to the king. And even if he did take back, those three pawns, tripled pawns, would be tremendous weaknesses. He came back to g6, and now I played the move bishop to g2. After bishop g2, my opponent castled queenside, and I castled kingside. And now we have the beginning of what could be a race. When the opponents castle on different sides of the board, what the position often comes down to is a race for the king. Here, 
white is going to be way ahead in the race because first of all his queen set is very weak because the c6 pawn is a weakness i'm going to play the move b4 and a4 and soon play the move b5 breaking down his pawn structure and this brings up a very important idea in attack it's much easier to attack when your opponent has a weakness in this position his queen side has a very specific weakness, the pawn on c6. After b5, suddenly the lines are opening up around his king. If you imagine if his pawn were back on c7, things would be very different. It would be much harder to attack because then b5, for instance, wouldn't do anything. I'd have to push my pawns up to b5 and a5 and then play a move like b6 to sacrifice a pawn in any attempt to open up anything. You can see that the pawns, for instance, on a7, b7, and c7 are much more solid than that single difference of the pawn being on c6. And a lot of people, when they're being attacked on one side, have the inclination to move a pawn to stop the attack. But be very careful when you do that, because usually a pawn move in the area where you're being attacked will, will give yourself a weakness that your opponent can hone in on. So he played the move bishop to e7. Now notice also the relationship between my knight on h4 and his bishop on g6. I can take it whenever I want, and this makes things very difficult for him. But the black bishop on g6 can't move anywhere, and it's hard for him to develop his game around different plans because in any moment I can simply take it off the board while my knight at h4 is sitting pretty. So his idea of playing bishop e7 relates to pushing f6 to f5 with the idea of taking on h4. He's trying to get rid of that knight, but it'll be interesting for you to notice how I respond to that moment. One more thing, many of you guys have heard, heard the expression, the knight on the rim is dim. That's something which my which Bruce Pendelfini used to tell me. Um, it's true that a knight on the edge of the board has much less dynamic possibility, has much less movement than a knight in the center of the board. If you consider the fact that a knight on the e4 square on an empty board controls eight squares, and a knight on the side on h4 controls only four squares, while a knight in the corner on h1, for instance, controls only two squares. In this particular position, my knight on h4 fulfills a very specific purpose. It attacks the bishop on g6 and, and limits that bishop to the point where it's almost not even on the board. After bishop e7, I played the move b4, and my opponent played f5. So what, what he's done is he's challenged me. He's challenged my knight on h4. The question is, what am I going to do with it? And here we reach an interesting moment in chess. I can take on g6, but it would be a mistake. If I play knight takes g6, then after h takes g6, I've done a number of things. For one thing, I've solidified his, his pawn structure. The pawns, you can see this strange kind of diamond of pawns, f7, e6, f5, g6. They support one another, and their one weak point, f7 square, is very hard for me to reach with two bishops, because a bishop can't get there. The reason I say that is because, for instance, if I had a knight, my knight on e5 would attack the f7 point, but nothing else can jump over pieces. And the other thing is that I'll have opened up the h file for him to work with. Now he has if he can double rooks, if you imagine him putting a rook on h5 and another rook on h8, he's attacking my h2 pawn. And so by simply playing knight takes g6, I've taken off a piece of uh, one of his pieces, which does absolutely nothing. I've solidified his pawn structure, and I've given him room to attack. Instead, I played the simple move knight f3. And we see that what's happened is my opponent played the move f5. I let him lock in his own bishop, and then I simply said, okay, I don't want it. Came back to f3. So, so I simply made him play the move f5. And I backed away, no problem. Now your bishop on g6 can't go anywhere. So he tried to give his bishop a little life, played bishop to h5. Now this might seem like a good piece for, to you, like his bishop on h5 pins the knight. You probably know that pins are good. But in fact, it's not such a useful piece, because for one thing, he can't utilize the pin, and I can get out of the pin whenever I want, queen d3. And another thing you should know is that whenever my queen moves out of the way, it'll almost force him to take on f3. The reason being, after my knight moves away, his bishop on h5 does absolutely nothing and will do absolutely nothing for a long time. Try to imagine what that bishop on h5 could ever do. It's just sitting there empty. So the bishop on h5 can take on f3, but if I play correctly, I can make that completely unimportant. And so I continued my attack with a4. My opponent played queen c7, a defensive move. The reason he did that is because I had a threat. I wanted to play the move a5, and after he goes back to c7, play the move a6. Boom, boom. And suddenly everything is opening up. My, the c6 pawn will be very weak because the b7 pawn is leaving. And I've undermined this attacking point. You can see that if he were to play pawn takes pawn on a6, I would play queen takes a6 check, and he'd be in big trouble. And if he plays the move b6, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my queen to e3. And I'm going to slowly pile up on the c6 pawn. And my opponent's going to be in a big problem because he has no real way to continue 
to develop a plan of his own. It's also important for you to notice that if he leaves my knight on f3, his knight on d7 can't move. Because if his knight comes to f6, it allows my knight to jump into the e5 square. Boom. And that knight is just completely brutal. Also, an important thing to notice is that my bishop will eventually come to the f4 square, pushing his queen back. All of black's pieces are bad, all of white's pieces are good, and his king is weak too. The relationship between the knight on f3 and the knight on d7 in this position might be interesting for you to take a look at. Um, a lot of the time in chess, when our opponent makes a move, we take the space that he left behind. And here, not, his knight on d7 is the only... It's locked to that square because if it moves, my knight will hop into a very good square. So his knight is is made into a purely defensive piece by my knight just sitting on f3, doing, it seems, like nothing. So my opponent played queen c7 with the idea of if I play a5, he would quickly play a6 and try to blockade my attack. Of course, I'm not going to do that. I played b5. So now I'm undermining this, the c6 pawn in a different way, a more direct way, actually. If he takes on b5, then after a takes b5, the a7 pawn is attacked and my bishop on g2 comes alive. So my attack is coming up. Lines are opening up around his king. The first step to the attack is to open up lines around your opponent's king. And a very important thing to understand is that in an attack, when you decide to attack, it doesn't mean that you decide to mate. It means that you have to take these things step by step and have faith in the natural progression of the attack. So in this position, I'm not playing mate. First of all, I'm opening up some lines, then I'm developing my pieces towards the attack. I'm doubling rooks sometimes. I'll slowly move forward and then I'll mate him. It's not just attack and mate. It's a long development to attack. And so don't get too excited. Take your time and play the best moves. After b5, my opponent said, I'm not going to let you open up either the A or the B file, and he played C5, a natural move. I responded to C5 with A5, and now we seem to see that inevitably something's going to open up. Whenever I want to, I can play the move B6, sacrificing a pawn, and if, if he takes it twice, then I'll have the A file opened up. I don't have to do it yet, but just the fact that I can do that whenever I want makes Black's position very difficult. After A5, he played Knight F6. And here, I did a big calculation, and I played a forced series of moves that, that won the game. Take a moment and just think about how you would like to continue the attack, what you think is the correct idea. Even if you don't see all the variations, think about what, the, what kind of ideas you think are good for white. We've been looking at the fact we want to open up the game on the queen side, right? We've also talked about the fact that the relationship between the knight on f3 and the knight on d7 was such that if the knight moved, my knight would jump in. We also talked about the fact that I wanted to play the move bishop on c1 to f4 at one point. All those ideas are, have to be used, but you got to use them in the right order. If I were to play bishop f4 immediately, my opponent would just play bishop to d6, blockading it all. I can't play knight e5 immediately because I would simply lose my queen. I began with the pawn sacrifice b6. My opponent has to take. You can, you can see quickly that if he moves his queen anywhere, the whole queen side can open up, and I might even use this very clever idea of playing a6, and everything is falling apart for black. You can see that the black pawns on b7 and a7, the white pawns on a6 and b6, spell the total explosion of the queen side and the black king. He played a takes b6. Now what do you think I did? It's very important to play the correct order of moves in an attack. The most natural move is a takes b6, and after queen takes b6, to play rook a8 check. But this doesn't do anything. My opponent would simply play king c7. I have another check, yes, bishop f4. No big deal. After bishop d6, there's no way for me to continue my attack, and in fact, that rook on a8 that just ran down and checked him has to be traded off immediately, and things don't work out. So what we see is that if I just run forward in the attack and do it immediately, it doesn't work. I have to be a little bit patient. Remember all the different entities which I've described. My bishop on c1 coming into the game, my knight on f3 maybe coming into the game. The idea of opening up as many lines as I can and bring both rooks into the attack. I want to do it all the right way. So first I played b6, he took. Now I played the move bishop f4. And now, if he moves his queen, then after a takes b6, I've gotten a bonus move, my bishop on f4 coming into the game. And if he blocks like he did with bishop d6, then, instead of having to worry about that tension between the two bishops, I throw in an in-between move, pawn takes pawn, a takes b6. My opponent's queen is attacked. He has to do something. He plays queen takes b6. And now again, one inclination may be to play rook a check fast. Another inclination may be to play bishop takes bishop fast. But the point of the move order that I did 
is that by playing my bishop on c1 out and first giving up the pawn, I allowed myself the option of playing rook f to b1, another in-between move. By playing the perfect order of moves, I got both my bishop on f4 out, my dark squared bishop out, and my both rooks are now knifing into his position. After rook f to b1, black is in big trouble. He played queen c6, which brings up an interesting tension in the position, which is that my knight on f3 is pinned by his bishop on h5, but if my knight on f3 moves, then I'm threatening his queen on c6 with my bishop on g2. So I have a very good potential weapon, but which is stopped immediately, because my knight can't move yet, but if I move my queen, it can move. So I have this complexity that I can play around with. I play bishop takes d6, and here my opponent has two options, rook takes or queen takes. Which one seems better to you? I'm sure you've decided on queen takes d6, because if he plays rook takes d6, then after rook a8 check, king c7, rook takes h8 wins a rook. So I'd be just winning here. Because of that, after bishop takes d6, he had to play queen takes d6. Now take a moment and decide how you would attack. I played queen b5, attacking his b7 pawn. The only way for him to defend is queen c6. Because if he defends the pawn with queen c7, then rook a8 check will give him big problems because he can't run away because I control that square. And if queen b8, I just take it. He played queen c6. He played queen c6. I played rook a8 check. And after king c7, queen a5 check. He's in big trouble. If he plays king d7, finally we see what I was talking about the whole time. My queen is no longer on the e2 square, so my knight is freed up. And it can jump into the game with knight e5 check winning the queen on c6. If instead he played king to d6 after queen a5 check, I could take on d8, rook takes d8, and after he takes back, queen takes d8, I've won a rook, and his king is still being chased. So after queen a5 check, his only move is b6. What did I see here? It seems like for a moment black is defending everything. My queen is attacked, my rook is attacked, his king looks safe, but notice that his b6 pawn is, a, is defended twice and attacked twice. Here I used a theme of removing the defender to push his king away from the defense of the b6 pawn, rook a7 check, and my opponent resigned. No matter where the king goes, any of the three possibilities, c8, b8, or d6, my next move will be rook takes b6, and then I'm either going to win his queen or mate him very quickly. So we gave up the game. So when thinking about this game, I want you to remember a number of themes which I used in it. For one thing, notice the tension that I had early on in the game between my knight and his bishop, and that the only way for him to develop his play was to force my knight off of the h4 square, which made his bishop bad. So what this relates to in chess is the idea of potential as opposed to the immediate. I could potentially take it. I never took the bishop, but I forced him to weaken his position by the potential to take the bishop at any moment. And also I used a lot of, uh, a big idea which I used was watching what my opponent's idea was. In the very beginning, he stopped me from castling and I didn't allow him to do that. And so by stopping my opponent's ideas, I put a real cramp in his style in his development. Now another theme which was very important in this game was the idea of a weakness in the king's position. My king side was very solid and his queen side pawn structure with the pawn on c6 allowed me to undermine it with the b4 to b5 thrust. Again, maybe you should look it over yourself and notice that if, if you try to create a pawn storm against a king's position in which there are no pawn weaknesses, it's very, very hard. But if there's a little edge sticking out, something to grab onto, you can often open lines and begin a big destructive attack.